Do you like books? I mean, really, really like books? Then you're in the right place. Each week, your host, Sam Hankin, interviews the best of today's top-selling authors and the up-and-coming superstars of modern literature. This is The Avid Reader. Here is your host, Sam Hankin. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another edition of The Avid Reader, brought to you by Wellington Square Bookshop. Our guest today is Louise Candish, author of The Heights, out in hardback last year, and it will be released by Atria in trade pack, paperback in March. Uh, Louise is the author of 15 novels, which is quite an achievement, including the number one bestseller, Our House, and The Other Passenger. So our protagonist, Ellen, in and about Shad Thames, has suffered a great loss, a loss that is inextricable from her whole being. Notwithstanding, she undertakes a series of steps to attempt to alleviate her suffering and to obtain a certain recompense from the villain who's stolen her son. I'm trying not to do spoilers here. Um, I think you're doing it so brilliantly and discreetly. It's, yes, and I <laughs> don't like reading the reviews and seeing, um, well, I won't say it. Anyway, so, okay, so she's in bad shape, um, but the way this novel is constructed, it's almost, I say almost, a novel within a novel. And it sends the reader kind of meandering along paths where, wait a minute, it, should I be going this way or that? And that's especially true when you have a narrator who may very well be unreliable from time to time. And I did say maybe, so I'm not saying she is or she isn't. So Ellen, Ellen's scheme of revenge is also impacted by something that permeates the book, which is called the high place phenomenon or the call of the void. Uh, and we can talk about that too. But first, let's meet L Lucas and Kieran and Ellen and Vic and even Michaela. Uh, and see what they have to say for themselves. So, hi, Louise. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi, thank you for inviting me on. And I love your, I love your introduction to the Heights. Great. Thanks. Well, here's one a question. I, I've read. I like reading science, science fiction, um, lots of old books. But I never really have been. I'm glad I read this book because I never really understood. Okay, how about this? What is a thriller? What exactly is a thriller and why are they called thrillers and why are we so drawn to them? Um, oh my God, I mean, I don't know. I mean, um, labels and categories and genres are very much something that I feel is sort of imposed on authors and is handy for um, retailers like yourself and for journalists and reviewers and, you know, even for readers. But from my point of view, I'm, I don't set out to write a, a thriller. I don't set out to write um, a drama is it, or suspense, um, but my books, have all those elements in them and so I suppose in the you know the most basic um, definition of a thriller would be something that you know is an exhilarating read that is is a page turner I think something that's constantly propelling you forward so that you you know you have to find out what's going to happen but frankly I think that could apply to any good book and um, you know my books are often described as psychological suspense and, you know, I, I would hope that any good book would have psychological elements and any good book would have suspense. So, um, so I, you, you've, you've met someone who, you know, I'm, I slightly kind of resist labels. And um, you mentioned that I've, I've written 15 novels. And I think over the course of those novels, I've, I've had every label applied to me. So I tend to take them with a pinch of salt. And um, and certainly the Heights is a is a hybrid book, I suppose, as you as you mentioned, it's a book within a book. So it's got that kind of meta thing going on um, that you perhaps wouldn't get in a straightforward um, thriller. Um, and it's also got, um, you know, quite a lot of emotional drama in it. It's, you know, it's a family drama as much as anything else. But it does also have those you know, those elements that in this case, I think are quite Hitchcockian, you know, you've got the kind of the narrator spotting something devastating from a window by accident, and that sets a crime in, um, in motion. So it's, it's lots of different things all rolled into one. And, and actually did feel quite experimental when I was writing it and quite new for me. I like um, when Justin, uh, First, meet, first meets Ellen and you throw in, not throw in, very well done, uh, say, is that why your hair is, you know, like Kim Novak's? 
and then he makes the reference to the birds, which is hilarious. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, the fact that she's called Ellen Saint, you know, there's just a couple of little sort of in, in jokes for, you know, little in references. Um, and she does have this form of vertigo that you mentioned, um, high place phenomenon, which, um, you know, in as in any good Hitchcock movie or in any good thriller, there's a reason why, you know, someone has their frailties mentioned or their phobia mentioned, you know, it's going to come up. And, um, you know, it's very tough for Ellen to, um, you know, engage with her antagonist, Kieran Watts, who you mentioned, um, because he lives on the top floor of a, a tall building and um, he's got this roof terrace and high place phenomenon means that you, when you go to the, um, the, the sort of sheer edge of something, say a cliff or a balcony or a roof terrace, um, or even a bridge or something like that, you um, you get this kind of weird irrational urge to jump or to sort of, you know, throw yourself off. Um, and so um, his, where Kieran lives, um, poses, you know, a real problem for Ellen in her dealings with him. Do you have any of that in you? Like the idea when you go up, do you ever have that feeling? Because I actually do have that feeling. Yeah, like yeah, oh God, yeah, absolutely. And um, interestingly, I would say about half the people that have been interviewing me about the, about this book say they've got it because I had thought that it was about one in 10 because when I, you know, started to telling people about this weird urge, um, you know, it would just be the occasional person who, who would say, oh, yeah, I know what you mean. But actually, you know, I'm, you're about the fourth person in a row who said, oh, I've got that. I've got that urge. It's very strange. And I think people don't it's not a kind of um, full blown phobia. It's a very niche sort of condition. Um, and it really is a form of intrusive thought, I think. And it's not um, although I guess it's it's a form of anxiety in a way. It's not you know, you're not at all suicidal or depressed or wanting to you know do yourself harm it's just a weird intrusive thought where you think if I just stepped i it would all be over and it would it's that sense that it's so easy I think in those situations to you know just double over um this kind of ballast balustrade or this you know this bridge railing or whatever and you know you could you can sort of see yourself falling into the void it's a really strange feeling isn't it yeah, and the other thing is, well, I think it was some kind of Sartre-esque or Camus saying something about, you know, the, the, the most important choice you can make in this planet is either whether you live or whether you die. But it's always totally your choice. It's like when you're driving down the road, you could just move the steering wheel just like that. Yeah. That'd be the end of everything. And that is a really common parallel with... Um, with high place phenomenon, that's um, that's a, almost like a cousin condition. That sense that you will steer your car, you know, off the road into a tree or into a lorry or a truck or something. Really similar. Um, I suppose that sense that you know power over your own, um, you know, kind of um, continuing life. It's it's very odd. Um, I hope no one acts on it. I hope that I hope everyone's like us and they're just aware of it. And then you kind of, you know, you like say to yourself, I oh, don't be ridiculous. Of course, you're not yeah, going to no, do that. No. <laughs> when you say you're not suicidal, it, it has nothing to do with suicide. It's no, more no. with autonomy. And also, I think an element of pride afterwards that you didn't do it. You know, that. Yeah. Yeah, You're absolutely. Yeah, charge. that we're sane after all. Yeah, totally. I do um, in a, in its minor form. Um, I do know of um, someone who had the urge to throw her bag into, um, you know, like an enclosure at the zoo. It's exactly the same urge, you know, that kind of I'm really going to make my life miserable if I do this ridiculous thing because I'm going to have to you know deal with all of the problems of not being able to get you know cancel all your bank cards and call all those numbers and get everything replaced and she did actually throw her bag into the into oh, this enclosure she never got it back and it's like well you know there was there was no pleasure in giving into the urge that's for sure <laughs> I think I may have done a thing like a thing or two like that in my life hey we should we should um we should try to sell your book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, you know, I could just say, what's your book about? But I'd rather if you could, because it, I, I love going to England and I've been to, to Shad Thames. And so I see the, the little walkways, the hamster tubes oh, that go back. Okay. And there is a place there called, uh, what is it? Spice, 
Spice Quay Heights. But it's called, yeah, there... yeah. There is, yeah. All for those who don't know this area, it's near Tower Bridge, the sort of iconic bridge and on, on the Thames. Um, and right near there, there's a little neighborhood called Chad Thames, and it's where all of the Victorian um, warehouses were and the wharves so all of the um, boats would come up the Thames and then they'd unload in Chad Thames um, and you know the things lots of spices and lots of products like that so the buildings retain those names so you do have you know cardamom wharf and um, vanilla sesame and vanilla um tower or you know they're, they're all names like that and they're really um it's really cool um and um it was very kind of deserted until the 1980s and then um terence conran the designer um, started this program of gentrification there and so all of these old warehouses are now um you know incredibly expensive apartments um but yeah it's a really atmospheric setting for the heights um and um you know because it because you it, you really get that sense of terrible things having having taken place in this area in the past you know you still see the sort of gallows where people you know used to be hanged for you know stealing a kipper or something um and um you know there's a real sense of the blood running you know sort of um down the cobbled walkways um, so for me, it was, you know, it was really central to the story. Um, I had actually set my previous novel, The Other Passenger, on commuters going up and down the river. So um, it had been in the back of my mind as a little parcel of the Thames that I might like to, you know, sort of shine more of a light on. Um, actually, although the building that Kieran Watts lives in is called The Heights, it's a fairly low level district. Um, you know, probably most of the buildings are four or five floors. Um, and so his his building is you know problematic because it's it's higher, um, but yes to um, to sort of set the scene and and you know I, I think it's okay to to do this because it's a little bit of a spoiler but you do find out at you know within a few pages that when Ellen um, looks out of the window of a client's um, apartment in Chad Thames she sees this person on the roof terrace of this taller building opposite. And she, you know, is paralyzed with um, with terror and um, just confusion because she believes she recognizes this person instantly and she cannot understand what he's doing up there because he should be dead. She knows he's dead. And the reason she knows this is that she's killed him. Um, and so, you know, it's a terrifying opening for her you know, this sort of former enemy who she she thought she'd eliminated from her life, literally, she thought she'd she killed him, um, appears to have come back to life. And how could that possibly be the case? Um, so that sets you up right at the beginning in the first few pages of what you're dealing with. And because she's such a kind of um, relatable, um, you know, she's quite stylish, middle class woman, um, you know, she's she's meeting with a client. She's, you know, obviously a responsible, reasonably successful citizen. And so, you know, the first question is what on earth has happened to her in the past that has led her to be, you know, sort of entangled in some kind of a murder or manslaughter or something? You know, how, do that, how is it that she thinks she's killed someone? What would have driven her to that? And so you then step back in time and you see, you know, this this horrifying um, series of events in the past relating to her son, Lucas. Okay, well, speaking of Lucas, then let's maybe set out kind of like a family tree, if you would, you know, that we, we have Justin, we have Freya, we have Lucas, and then we have Vic. So if you could give that, I think that would help a lot to just give us an idea of who these people are. Yeah, absolutely. So Ellen um, is in her 40s now, but in her very early 20s, straight out of university, she became pregnant um, with her boyfriend, Vic, and they had a baby son, Lucas. So they're very young parents. They, they don't marry, but they, they start to parent together. And then when Lucas is about five, Ellen falls in love with Justin and um, they become partners. Vic remains on the scene, helping her co-parent, Lucas, Meanwhile, Ellen and Justin have a baby of their own called Freya. Um, and so Ellen, Justin, Lucas and Freya live together in a beautiful house in, in the suburbs. And um, Vic lives around the corner in a kind of um, slightly um, sleazy flat. 
Uh, but at least he's at least he's on hand. He's in the neighborhood and he's doing his best. So it's a kind of um, blended family and, um, you know, sort of a, quite a sort of modern, um, you know, kind of complicated family setup. But they're doing OK until um, Lucas reaches um, what we would call sixth form here, which I'm guessing you would call senior high, would you, when you're sort of 16 yeah. to 18? Um, and Lucas falls under the influence of a brand new best friend called Kieran Watts, who, um, as far as Ellen is concerned, is the devil incarnate. And, you know, she's been incredibly close to Lucas. He's a golden boy. He's, um, he's academic. He's popular. He's good looking. He's likely going to Oxford or Cambridge or a great university. Um, she, you know, she couldn't be prouder of him. She's one of those mums who's sort of slightly in love with her own child. Um, so Kieran comes along, he's a druggie, he's into partying, he's not that bothered about grades, he couldn't care less about university. Um, he's got an extremely troubled family history and suddenly he is Lucas's number one influence and he has knocked Ellen out of the water. No, she no longer has any any influence and she can't handle it. And so this this sort of bizarre feud develops between the mum and the son's best friend, which, you know, was a very fascinating relationship to me and not one I'd read about that much in fiction. Um, I thought, I, I, and you know, sort of drawing on my own experience as a parent and the kind of conversations I have with other parents, you know, it's one of those um, primal fears that your child will fall in with, you know, the worst possible person in the class than, you know, the, the last one you would have chosen to be their friend, they have plucked as their best friend. Yeah, it's funny, um, since your books are often, and will be miniseries or, or they're optioned, you, you, <coughs> you kind of chose your protagonist for Lucas in the book, which I, oh, Timothy, <laughs> tell who, who you chose oh yes be. that's right yeah that's right they I've forgotten about that um she um she says when she when Ellen is describing Lucas to the reader because she is um she is writing a kind of memoir she's gone to a um a kind of crime crime memoir um write writer's workshop to learn how to to write her story and come to terms with it and um, yeah, she says, um, if, the, if the book's ever optioned, if her book's ever optioned, Timothy Chalamet will play Lucas. And, you know, it gives us an idea of how he looks. He's very romantic looking, you know, he's a he's beautiful boy. Um, I'd completely forgotten about that. That's brilliant detail. <laughs> and and the, book has, the book has been optioned. So, um, well, but we haven't spoken of, yeah, we haven't got, got to the casting stage, but um, <laughs> let's see which side of the Atlantic it's set on before bringing Timothy into the mix. That's true. Like, uh, it kind of set me off though, because you describe both of them very well. And so when you describe Kieran and, and you're meticulous about it, from his red hair, which puts some people off, to his acne, to his stature, uh, you don't say fat or you say thick, not what do you say, I can't remember the word you use, not, not thick, but some, it's a really good word for describing someone who isn't in the greatest of shape. Yeah, and he's yet, maybe heavy set or something. He's maybe, I can't remember, but yeah, he's kind yeah. of, um, he's physically unappealing to Ellen um and um yeah he's got bumpy skin but the main thing is that you know he he doesn't make eye contact he's just got no social graces and you know she knows that his background means that she should be the grown-up um in this situation and she should remind herself that he hasn't had the advantages that her kids have had but in spite of knowing how she should react to him her um you know her instinct it's an animal instinct about him she just thinks he is evil you know she really thinks he's he's bad news um which he is she's right yeah it's interesting though because normally you turn things on their head because normally someone like kieran who just gets to a school he would love to be befriended by someone like lucas and then they all think he's incredible and you leave it up to the reader to decide okay why are they drawn to him what is it about him uh and it even goes that thread passes through the entire book even until the interesting end ending of the book um 
so yeah, I was I was surprised that you know generally you can nail villains and heroes pretty early on, and I can say that you know whether you're looking at I don't know if you're looking at Justin or Lucas or Jade or Prisca, they're all relatively good people. They're good people in different ways. Vic, you know, I'm not quite sure. You know, <laughs> I, at first I thought, yeah, he's he's a great guy. He's helping out. You know, he's still. But then, you know, whatever. I'm not yeah, no, I think absolutely. And, um, you know, on the surface, I think that, you know, Vic does have a much more reasonable um, reaction to Kieran. Ellen's reaction is an overreaction. I mean, she is, you know, she has an extraordinary animal response to Kieran, which the others can't quite understand. Um, but, you know, there's always, whenever you, um, you know, you, you have the narrative um, dictated, by one of the antagonists you're never really going to find out exactly what the truth is about right. the person they despise we don't ever get inside kieran's head um we don't get inside lucas's head we're only hearing this story through ellen and um vic and so um you know there there is that kind of really interesting ambiguity about the people they're talking about and so you know it's um you know, I'm expecting a lot of the reader to, to make their minds up and to, you know, piece together what they're hearing and the evidence they're getting. You know, Ellen is, is not just telling her story, she's writing it in a, you know, very structured way. And um, she is controlling every detail of what she tells us about Kieran. Um, and so you really need to look at Vic's portion of the narrative to, you know, to get some balance there. So, you know, it's an, it's an interesting sort of task. It's an interesting puzzle for the reader. It's not straightforward. Um, and, you know, you may, you may get to the end and still not be entirely sure who's telling the truth about, you know, every single incident and every single action. Um, but that's part of the fun, I think. It's not all prescribed for you. It's um, presented as a, as a puzzle, I suppose. Yeah, and that's exactly what I would say. I mean, again, owning the bookshop, I always direct people to books that when they're done, the reader still has to do some more work and, and is still going to be involved in it. And you make it doubly true in that Ellen will look at us and say, that got you, didn't it? And if, you didn't, if it didn't get you, then I guess I'm not going to be worth writing this. Or especially when she does that about, You'll be interested. You'll definitely be interested in the gun. And then I yeah. thought, of, yeah, thought of that, the guy who said, "Who I can't remember who it was, Parandella or someone who said, if you see a gun in the first act, it has to go off in the third. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. The gun's introduced quite, quite late on, isn't it? But yeah, she's very self-aware and she's growing in confidence as a writer. I think we can say that as a first time writer, she's very good. And um, we can also say, I think, that um, her book is so good from this workshop that it's going to be published. And so another little strand that you get um, in the book is um, the Sunday Times um, writer who is interviewing Ellen um, on publication of her book, this um, memoir called Saint or Sinner. And, um, and I think that, you know, there's enough, in, 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 enough doubt in the tone of this journalist um, you know, to, to, for her to be sort of be doing the job that I think the reader will be doing, which is, you know, slightly questioning it, Ellen and saying, you know, okay, yes, she's beautiful and she's charismatic and, you know, she's, she's been through the mill, but is she, you know, is she all that she presents herself to be? And interestingly, when we recorded the audio book, I played the part of the sarcastic journalist, which I enjoyed immensely. <laughs> I can't think why I sprang to mind as a possible actor for that role. But um, it's although there's maybe, you know, sort of 12 pages in the voice of the journalist, I think they're quite important because they give you an opportunity to kind of pause and think, OK, you know, this is this is a, a bit of a, you know, there's a note of wariness here in um, in her response to Ellen. So should, you know, should I feel the same? Should I be doubting Ellen or have I, you know, is she telling the truth? Yeah, and I went so far as to see, because the first one, when she signs off, it says December, 2021. And part of me is going, oh, this all happened just 
she just wrote this a couple of months ago. I'm thinking, no, no, this is part of, I, for a second, I thought, okay, I'm reading about this actual situation. So uh, when, okay. it came hardback, when, it, when it came out in hardback, you must've had a different date there because it came um, out. No, 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 it was just in the future. Yeah, it came out in, um, in the UK last year, but I quite often will have dates in my books that you know, take us a little bit beyond the publication date. Um, you know, I'm not really referencing real life events, so um, I don't think it matters too much. It's not like, you know, I've forgotten about the Olympics or, you know, I have I, I don't tend to reference real life stuff that much. So I feel, you know, OK about moving into the future a little bit. It's not like it's, you know, 30 years away and there's going to be some dystopia. I think I'm, you know, I'm reasonably confident that the trains are still going to be running. <laughs> six months from now <laughs> I don't know if I'm, my confidence level has gone down a bit yeah no. <laughs> yeah um, absolutely I used to be a lot more confident now I'm you know a little bit doubtful but I'm still no I still had to do it really for the dates that I'd set up but you know don't get me started on timelines that's that's something that I struggle with and always like editors and, and proofreaders and the whole team you know, is um, always keeping me on the straight and narrow with my timelines because they're often quite complicated. And, you know, the moment you make a tiny change, it radiates up and down the timeline. And, um, and you know, and you're, you're tearing your hair out. It, it, um, the other thing I was going to mention about Ellen and unreliability is and this is kind of like a theme that goes through lots of books is when the young couple is in love and they're separated and the lover has to write his love and explain that he still loves her and that she means the world to him. And then the mean stepmother steps in and when the mail comes, you know, and, and I thought you shouldn't be doing this at least let, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, all I'll say is that I am a fan of estranged couples in as my narrators. I've done it before with our house, um, where you know this this um, the parents have split up and they are bird nesting with their kids. You know, they're taking it in turns to um, to live in the family home. Um, so you know that was very very central to our house, um, and um, the, the here it's it's much more that Vic will. You know, when you when you once loved someone, you will always have that legacy. And I think when you share a child as well, you know, there's you know, there's that lifelong tie to that person. So even if you've fallen out of love with them, there's still a legacy of something very positive and warm. Um, and, you know, so it's bittersweet, I suppose, you know, and so Vic can be very, very realistic about Ellen. Um, but he, you know, so he can be both highly critical, but he also is quite forgiving because he knows her and he knows that she means well. And, um, you know, she's an interesting one because she's, you know, to some people, some readers won't find her very likable and they'll wonder why these two nice guys, uh, you know, are both jumping through hoops for her and protecting her and covering up for her and, um, you know, just constantly forgiving her. And when she's so neurotic, and you know, making some you know slightly dodgy decisions, but you know the the answer is that they both fell in love with her. You know, one is still in love with her. One used to be, but he just remembers. Um, he still got all of that in in his DNA. Um, and then you know, again, without giving the game away with what happens in the plot, you know, a huge family upheaval occurs, and then they share the after, you know the fallout of that, and they'll share that forever. So, um, so yeah, I do like a, I do like an estranged couple. I think you get a really nice, complicated blend of emotions. And also, from the reader's point of view, you're never quite sure, um, you know, that it's not a hundred percent fidelity to each other. So there's they're always open to a little bit of deception or a um, a little bit of ambiguity. So it's brilliant for plotting when you've got estranged couples. Well, in this particular triangle, both Justin and Vic they have coping me mechanisms for dealing with Ellen. And the coping mechanisms basically are to make her feel that she's more valuable to herself and to not yell at her and say, why are you even, what is, what is wrong with you? No, neither of them would say that to her, would they? 
no, because they know that will only make her more stubborn. So yeah. um, in their own ways, they've each developed a management strategy, which is go along with whatever she says and then wait for her to change her mind or to you know come to a different conclusion but better to support her I mean it's almost like dealing with a child isn't it but you know support and let them realize the error of of their ways themselves rather than pointing everything out only to get pushed back on about it so um yeah I mean Vic actually you know so he lays out his strategy doesn't he and says oh I should have maybe I should have written this up and given it to Justin when they got married um, this is the best way to deal with her you go along with it and or you appear to go along with it and um you know you manage you manage her she has to be managed because she's you know a highly emotional individual and she's a tiger mother to end all tiger mothers so you know they then it's hard for them to um you know to get her to be rational about something that she just feels such passion for even in the early pages when she's in the apartment across from the heights and then you could there's all there's not it's not really comedy but there is are, are humorous moments in the book that lighten things up like when she goes across the street and uh, knocks and he, the gentleman who's head of Sora head of whatever he is he he tries to get her name, she, she says a name, and then she, she makes it so that she can't not be discovered as this amateur sleuth. And, but she, does, she doesn't think it out first. She just runs no, across No, no, absolutely. I mean, she's a, she's a great character in, a, in, in the sense that she's very, you know, she stands up to, you know, some of these men who are, you know, would be intimidating to others or who would be steamrollering over everyone who, you know, comes in their path. She's, you know, she, the strength of her conviction is extraordinary. And um, yeah, there are, there's always comic moments in my, in my books. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Vic in particular is quite sardonic. So you'll get, you'll get a bit of relief, a bit of light relief with Vic, but, you know, don't be lulled into too much of a sense of false security <laughs> with any of my characters ever because they're never as, you know, simple as they may at first appear. So I was, when I was researching, obviously, even though I don't like the term going down the rabbit hole, I found that there is a piece of software called MoodSmart. Did you know that? Oh, oh my God. No, I didn't. And that, that, well, that must be quite recent because we, um, my researcher did, you know, a deep dive into the names. We had a number of possible names. And, um, you know, and it was obviously important to choose one that, you know, wasn't out there. Um, but hope for, hopefully it won't lead to any legal challenges. It does. The software actually does deal with mental illness and how to, how to put a governor on people's actions. And it uses all kinds of algorithms and stuff. So oh, it also wow. looks like, just type, well, obviously just type it in, but it, it looks like it's a startup or a Kickstarter kind of thing. So yeah, yeah, when I was when certainly when I wrote this book, which of course now will have been, it came out in the UK in 20, yeah, I was writing it in 2020, Mood Smart was not a thing then. So um, yeah, it's a great name though. But yeah, we had a number of, of possibilities. Um, but it's not nearly as developed as the amazing app in Ruth Ware's book, um, One by One, where she's got this fantastic sort of music app. And it just sounds so great. You just think, my God, you should have ditched the novel and, you know, sold your app idea for 10 million and, um, you know, spent, spent the time on that because it really is such a great idea. Mood Smart was very much, you know, I mean, I didn't, um, other than, you know, checking out that um, it was, you know, the name was available and um, it was a relatively authentic idea. I didn't really give it an enormous amount of thought um but it did you know it, it it's what kieran has been working on and um you know needs to, he, he need, they, we need an explanation as to how he's um you know living in this amazing apartment and you know able to buy himself a certain amount of anonymity which the schoolboy kieran would have had you know absolutely no access to i i interviewed ruth ware 
I got, I forget what book it was that I interviewed her for. She was a lovely person. It was yeah, beautiful. she's great. Yeah, she's great. And so, yeah, so she blurb. You must be happy that you know she blurb the book or praised it. And she, it's on the cover. Of, oh, I know what you should do. She, show up the the cover of your book so people in America can. If you have the American cover. Yeah. Right. This is the America one. It just arrived in the post the other day, actually. So great timing. Yeah. So well, it's got a very, it's got a lovely kind of Hitchcockian um cover actually she's very i think she's straight out of hitchcock that um that woman even um, her hair yeah maybe a bit younger than ellen ellen's in her 40s but um yeah, well, but yeah Michaela, great it's a great image yeah it's a great cover and you know i say this to everybody but as a bookseller and the reason why publishers generally are in charge of the covers to a certain extent Everyone who comes into my bookstore judges the books by their cover. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they've got nothing else to go on unless they've, you know, they've read a review and they've marched straight in on that basis. Right. Um, you know, that that really is all you've got to go on. And then, you know, if, you, if you're lucky, you know, they'll pick it up and read the blurb on the back and then then it kind of stands or falls on that. Um, so, yeah, it just you can't overstate how important a cover is, can you? Because... Um, it's not like you're going to read it and then decide to buy it. You're going to, you've, you've got to, by definition, you're buying it before you read it. Or I hand sell it for you. Yeah, you please. Yeah. Actually, my books have, um, you know, have gained a lot of word of mouth, which, you know, we all know how important that is. And you just can't contrive it and you can't buy it. You just have to wait and see if it happens. Um, but the Heights is kind of is is one of a handful of mine that I think has word of mouth, and I think it is because of that, um, you know that that idea of the kind of overprotective parent, and you know the, it, what's been interesting to me here is that I thought people would, I thought readers would find Ellen, um, you know, crazy, and there's no way they would act like that as a parent. But so many parents instead have said, oh, I so relate to her. I would have felt exactly the same. Um, and so I think I had sort of slightly underestimated the passion of parenting now. It really is something that we try to have quite a lot of control over. And, um, and I think Ellen speaks to that instinct um, in us. You know, she wants to control everything. She wants to protect her kids from any possible harm. Um, and in doing so, I think, you know, sort of creates the very damage that she's you know so so keen to uh, to avoid on their behalf it's really interesting I've been I'm really interested in parenting styles and how different they are you know my generation gen x compared to how we were brought up in that kind of benign neglect in the 70s and the 80s where your mum and dad didn't know the first thing about what you were doing no one was tracked in a sci-fi way on a device in their pocket you know, you literally just lied about where you were going. <laughs> that was the end of it. <laughs> you'd walk out the front door, at the, especially on weekends, beginning of the yeah. day, and then you'd come. And there's no cell phone. I could, if my children didn't have their phone with them, I would, I would be going crazy. I yeah. wouldn't know what to do. Right, yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. But, you know, we, our parents didn't have any of that. I was just talking um, with friends the other day about when, you're, you know, your kids go off traveling now. You would expect, um, you know, you'd expect to know they'd arrived safely. You'd probably be able to see photos they posted on an hourly basis. Whereas when I went backpacking in Australia when I was about 20, I don't think my parents heard from me in about six weeks. But they wouldn't yeah. have been weeping into their pillows or calling the police. They would have just trusted that everything was OK. Otherwise, they would, you know, surely they would know by now if I'd been, you know, sort of eaten by a shark or whatever. <laughs> I'm surprised my kids haven't turned the tracking off. But, you know, so Annie's <laughs> at the University of Richmond. And if she doesn't call me, I immediately look to see if she's in her dorm or near her dorm. And I don't even know what I would do if she was like, Oh God, if she was like 20 miles away from her dorm, I, I would get in my car and drive down there. Which, oh my God, you're like Ellen then. See, it's so easy to relate, isn't it? So how far away, how old is she? She's 20. 20, okay. So you kind of know where she is every day. Yes, well, I have, I have two, I have <laughs> two marriages and two sets of kids. 
But yeah, I know, where, I know where she is. And Samantha, my other daughter is going to a school nearby. She calls me every day like clockwork. And she always says the same thing. Hi, it's me. And, uh, but Annie, Annie, I, I call her up and she goes, hi, I have to go to class in 10 minutes. Bye. And that's yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. But that's great. That's great to, for you to just know, just to check in. I mean, my daughter just started at university. She's 18. And um, I, we probably connect um, once a week. So the rest of the time, and she's never been tracked on that. We never tracked on phones or did find a phone or anything. Um, and, um, and obviously we don't now. But um, so, you know, I, I might have six or seven days when I, you know, I'm just having to have blind faith in the fact that she's alive and well. Um, so it is old style in that respect, but, you know, I guess you just get used to it. But um, I, my preference would be for a daily check-in, but we, uh, we haven't done that. She, she requires a bit more independence, but um, it's just, it's nice to know though, isn't it, that you, you know, it, you, you can get hold of them because the phone is in their hand, um, you know, and I think that that's a good thing. It's funny because you have overprotective parents and underprotective parents. Mm. And they never know which one is better. Like my brother, we go to the we go to a baseball or a football game, and he his son Noah was like seven or eight years old. And I said, I said, where's Noah? And he goes, he's he's around here somewhere, but there's seventy thousand people. And then and then he see it's the exact opposite. And then some elderly woman brings him back, and she says, I found your son. He was wandering around. And Richard goes, Oh, thanks. But he, oh my he god he's as cool as a cucumber okay yeah they've all turned out well so yeah yeah i mean i think the thing is that you know there are just different styles and ultimately you know it is a very rare rare thing for something terrible to happen to a child so you know they do have nine lives um and you know i think it's important to be busy doing other things isn't it when your kids have flown the nest um otherwise it, you know you can get obsessed worrying about them yeah what what ellen has for both children is love but what happens almost is she's almost like when lucas first first meets karen and wants to go out and doesn't say goodbye appropriate she almost she feels offended that she no longer has this power you know there's a certain element of that that she has yeah, I think it's, I mean, you know, the, the grief is, is one of the themes of the, of the book. And we do come across it for the first time when she, you know, when she loses him to his friendship group. And, you know, when he's just grown up, he's still living at home, he's still in her house, but she's grieving the, you know, the younger child that she had a different relationship with. And it is very hard for all of us to, to admit that, you know, the friends are more important than we are. Because, you know, who doesn't love those early years when they worship you and, you know, they they believe everything you say and you're the, you know, you're the authority on everything and they run to you and it's lovely and it goes so quickly. So it is very, very hard. But um, what's interesting about Ellen is that she, in focusing on Lucas, you know, there's an element of neglect as far as Freya, her younger child, is concerned. And so, you know, she's lucky enough to have a fantastic father in Justin who is, you know, doing it all with with Freya but as the story progresses um Ellen's you know neurotic overparenting will you know will start to um find Freya um in in her sights and so Freya does get a little bit of a taste of it but they're also used to it I mean I that, that's what I find with in in real life with you know very neurotic control freak characters you know the family all know how to deal with it you know, there's a, you know, the the private eye rolling and the, oh yeah, you know what she's like. Yeah, just, you know, just tell her what she needs to hear. Um, and so they're all doing that. They all know how to handle Ellen. Yeah, it's funny about her unreliability, realizing that she's writing a memoir and all memoirs, in my opinion, are unreliable. But the one, one of the uh, threads that I found to be the most stable um, was Jade. Because I thought mm. Jade... She's just doing what she's doing. Ellen doesn't put a gloss on her behavior. You know, she just seems to be a, a very nice person. Yeah, yeah. Jade is Jade is Lucas's girlfriend, um, just to explain. 
Um, and, you know, she's just a lovely teen and um, Ellen sees everything in relation to Lucas. So um, Jade passes muster. She's happy with her. And, you know, she's sort of um, when when Kieran's presence is felt, there's an element of Ellen almost kind of using Jade in, as a as a pawn. You know, she's almost weaponizing Jade. So, you know, she'll invite Jade on holiday, but she won't invite Kieran. And, um, you know, it's, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't invite Kieran either. I no, I wouldn't. No. <laughs> not Definitely not. But there is a sort of sense that, um, you know, she quite enjoys the fact that she it's almost a taunt, isn't it? So like I'm leaving you out because she does invite, a, you know, another friend of Lucas's as well as his girlfriend. She invites a male friend as well. And, um, you know, she's deciding who she likes among Lucas's circle and inviting them on holiday. Um, but yeah, Jade is, Jade's, Jade's a nice girl. And, you know, she's, she, again, you don't get inside her head. You don't hear from her directly, but you, her interactions with Ellen and Vic respectively, um, I think are quite stabilizing. And I think you can trust what she says. There's not, she's not tricking or scheming. I think, you know, there's quite a few characters where, you know, when they speak, um, you know, you can believe what they say. Sometimes when I'm talking to you, I think I'm talking to Ellen. <laughs> have I, I like, just explained how cool I am? <laughs> well, she does. Sometimes she'll do something like um, when they're in, playing the video games and the internet goes down, and Karen is being a jackass and Lucas is ignoring his mom. But then there's Tom, this boy Tom, and she likes him because he gets up and he he says goodbye to her. <laughs> He said goodbye to her before she leaves. I thought, well, this Tom is, he should be hanging out with Tom, right? You know. Yeah, yeah. well, that's what she wants, absolutely. And Tom was the bestie and then Kieran came along. But yeah, I mean, we're all guilty of that, aren't we, as, as parents? You know, we really respond to the good manners. Um, I know I do. And, you know, as a parent, have had um, my daughter's friends on holiday with me. And, you know, you just can't help be charmed by good manners and helpful friends who you know offer to do things um and you know it's basic stuff but it really does work and so yes she really likes tom um but kieran wouldn't dream of saying hello or goodbye you know the very opposite he's um he acts like she she just doesn't uh, she doesn't exist or she certainly doesn't doesn't matter to him so it's infuriating yeah and and you juxtapose uh, with both Vic and Justin, but like it's like when um, Lucas uh, thought Freya's birthday was the day before and he's forced to go to dinner, but and he doesn't like sushi in the first place. And we have to sit by the window. And uh, whereas, and then, and Alan says that Justin and Freya are ganging up against her because they always do. And now she doesn't have two, it's just hers because Lucas is gone and she just gets all caught up in it. And then so I'm thinking, okay, when he, when he leaves and he turns around with his hand and does what he does, I'm thinking, okay, did he really do that or she just make that up? Yeah. You know? Yeah. Good question. Good question. And, um, and she says, doesn't she, um, you know, well, after she, she's perceived Kieran to have given her a dirty look, you know, she does say, you know, I know, I know this isn't good fellas. It's just a look, you know, I should have just ignored it. I mean, she is, there is self-awareness there. But there is something about this boy that has just got under her skin and that she just absolutely can't extract again. Um, and, you know, he's he's going to haunt her as long as she lives. Um, and, you know, I think that's a really terrifying prospect, you know, for any of us to feel that, you know, till our dying day, there's this person who hates us and who we hate and will never, ever forgive and will never come to terms with that um you know that animosity it's a really it's a it's a really horrible thing it makes me sort of shiver well it's like if you distilled what you just said down to three wor four words would be what prisca when 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 prisca comes over and when she leaves after a heated exchange she turns to ellen and says stop doing this to yourself don't, mm. don't do this to yourself and she, you know, Ellen paints her unfavorably, but she also says this is what she says. And, and Ellen also, 
also second guesses herself in that situation too. Yeah, she does. And, you know, I, th I thought all the time when I was writing this, you know, that famous, um, you know, sort of quote about revenge, Confucius, when you, em when you embark on a path of a journey, of, when you embark on a journey of revenge, I think it is, dig two graves. And, um, you know, this, that is at the heart of this book. This is um, in, in her feelings for Kieran, in um, her pursuit of him, in her, of her feud with him, she is damaging herself as much as she's damaging him. Um, and, it, you know, that makes this an absolute tragedy, the story, because, you know, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary to, 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 to follow um, the path that she followed. She chose to do that. And in doing so, she created far more destruction than, um, you know, than she thought twice as much. Yes. Yeah. And as you said about all parents, uh, we might have reacted in the same way. But the actions she takes are just so much further. And the other, the other thing I realized maybe just not too long ago is that everything that Ellen was asked or told or suggested not to do, she did. Yeah. Every yeah, single thing. Absolutely. But I do feel that about my characters in um, the books of mine that you know are thrillers. I do feel like they are they're living out, they're acting on something that would be like a dark fantasy that a normal person would have. You know, we all fantasize about revenge and we all fantasize about, you know, someone, you know, who's, who's um, you know, um, we don't like some enemy, you know, if something terrible could happen to them. You know, it's very natural to, um, to feel that, but my characters will act on it. That's the difference. They, they can't nip the fantasies in the bud. They, um, they often will, um, will set about, you know, sort of um, putting them into, into action. And, you know, that's obviously a big mistake and not what we would do. Well, I guess in conclusion, I think what I've, in addition to what I've learned and what I'm still thinking about in the novel is the idea that, you know, if, if you, as you just use the term thriller, now I realize what it is because you were very irritating to me because I did, I ha couldn't stop so I finished it like at three thirty in the morning and I had something oh, to do wow. at seven. You ruined my night. <laughs> so sorry. <laughs> it was it was well worth it and it, it was well worth you coming by today and talking to me. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. It's lovely to talk about it in such depth, and you know it really reminds me as well that you know when you deliver a book to your publisher and it's out there in the world, it's you know, the reader's interpretation of it is what it then is. You know, I'm, yeah. my view of it is, is just one of many. I don't think I'm necessarily the definitive, um, you know, sort of view. I think that everyone's interpretation, particularly in a book like this, where there is ambiguity and there is a certain amount of peeling back of the layers that the reader is required to do. It's not just presented by me and spoon fed. Um, yeah. I think it really becomes... It becomes the reader's rather than mine, I think. That's why I feel so proud of myself when I remember Tom and remember who Tom yeah. is. And it makes me feel good. I'm very myself. impressed. I think that you, you, I think you know it better than I do. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh yeah. It's, yeah. Um, well, I'm looking forward to your next and I'm looking forward to getting some of your back stock, which here in America, we didn't normally have and, and putting it on the front table and just stacking them oh, up. Oh yeah, that would be great. Yeah, so far four books, four books of mine out in, in the US. So I really hope your, your readers will enjoy, enjoy the heights. They will. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks Bye -bye. so much. Bye. Bye.